Tá, Márcio, ou é depois, não sei, na sequência? Não, aqui. Visa... <risos> Olha ali. <risos> Muito bem. Direto do, S... do CBA. Do CBA. Hum. Fez bastante sucesso o copinho. É, eu viajo semana que vem, André. Ah, semana que vem. Ótimo, Perfeito. te agradeço aí o seu empenho, a paciência de mudar as datas e buscar uma data, porque... É, o fuso horário é muito grande e, é, e, é complicado e aí ia assim, ser é uma confusão danada eu ia ter que entrar uma hora da manhã duas horas, eu não me lembro, era uma coisa assim que não, é. não ia dar certo aí realmente para mim foi maravilhoso assim é, a gente já fez atividades antes até com colegas né, da Europa e a grande dificuldade foi essa né? uh, a gente não pode mudar o horário até porque é o horário reservado né, para essas atividades e lá o fuso atrapalha bastante a gente até fez depois, posterior, gravou algumas aulas, né, com a ideia de gravar aulas e deixar na nossa plataforma com, eventualmente, alguns colegas uh, uh, do exterior, em virtude do fuso, né? Essa é uma dificuldade, realmente. O pessoal faz um esforço, mas meia-noite, uma da manhã, é complicado começar ah, é o webinar. É complicado, fica inviável. Eu, eu fiz um <risos> polonês lá pelo pessoal da, da Argentina, foi um horror, coitado, ele sofreu. Coitado. E foi brabo, mas tudo bem, vamos lá. Mas tudo bem. Bom, vamos lá, 20 horas e 30 minutos, então... Então, vamos começar. Boa noite, e, primeiro de tudo, eu gostaria de agradecer a todos os nossos colegas que estão acompanhando o nosso primeiro webinar para 2024. Como vocês já sabem, de março a outubro, cada ano, o Beach Presidente Journal of Anesthesiology organiza webinar activities every month, where the main focus is to discuss a few of the published articles by the publication recently, which have an important and also some clinical relevance, some clinical significance for anesthesiologists as a whole. These webinars, they are recorded in Portuguese as well as in translated version for English. And later, they are spread on our YouTube platform, all of our networks. Who may not be able to watch this, these webinars, the prior webinars, or this one itself, will be able to check out our activities from the start on our YouTube platform. It's been pretty positive, the feedback we've gotten from these activities. They're entirely open. Our friends, they can share the articles, share the lectures. The Bay JAN is an entirely open magazine with the whole support of the Brazilian Society of Anesthesiology. For downloading articles as well as for publications, there are no necessary fees. So it's really for everybody to access, all of our colleagues to access and share what's published in the publication. And today, to start our 2024 activities, we picked the most relevant subject matter, which deals with the airway control, breathing control. SBA organized a task force to establish recommendations for our reality, recommendations for Brazilian anesthesiologists. And this is also useful as another society pronouncing themselves regarding best strategies for airway control, which may be used by other countries compared to other publications and several societies they've already done this recently. So it's a pretty relevant subject matter, very special subject matter, and we'll have the chance to discuss this today. And also the next webinar, because task where they've set themselves to establish recommendations for difficult airway control in adults, also pediatricians. So you'll have activities on adults. And next month, we'll have these methods discussion regarding the control of difficult airways on pediatrics. and. We would not be able to have better speakers today. The one that will be moderating the event is Professor Vanessa Enriquez Carvalho. He's a professor from the Department of Anesthesiology from UNICAMP, associated editor of the BJAN for some time now. She's contributed in an incomparable manner to the evolution of the publications. He's been on several webinars. I am thankful to the professor. She's always available for editorials, everything that she's contributed upon about world science and our medium and to provide with scientific materials and pronouncing herself regarding the quality revision matters. Really, it's, it's exceptional quality materials that Vanessa has worked on with all of her scientific experience. And really, 
like to point this out once again thanking her so now i'll pass a word to professor vanessa who will be moderating the event hello good evening everyone i hope you are all feeling great welcome i'm thankful for the invitation of vjn dr andre schmidt and all our friends from vjn for me it's an honor to start that this kickoff for this year of webinars for BAJN with the subject that is it's a bit suspicious for me to talk about it because I'm very passionate about it, just as we have created a task force, a crucial task force, actually, really led by, well, actually orchestrated by Dr. Marcio de Pino, Mar de Pino Martins, which is a huge range of experience when it comes to working on and controlling difficult air air pathways when it comes to PJN and the SBA and our societies in the world. And it really is an honor to be able to moderate this panel, this webinar panel, which uh, actually is regarding the article which was published just now. And this is a Brazilian journal edition Anesthesiology for Brazilian Society of Anesthesiology for Difficult Airway Management and Adults. So I will pass the word to Dr. Marcio de Pino Martins. He's our chief president, our president of the Committee for Difficult Airways on SBA. And he is the man who understands the subject. Dr. Marcio, so thank you very much for those kind words. Your kind words, Vanessa, Dr. Andre's words. And well, for those of you who have not read the editorial yet, that was published on this exactly same number. I suggest for you to read this because really, these are some very, very kind words and they are published in this editorial. Really, this has been a struggle of ours to be able to have to create publications of the society for us to position the SBA, Brazilian Society of Astrology, in front of the world scientific community. Our uh, characteristics, they really are regarding hard work and teaching. But thankfully, things are changing because we always published very little. Our literature, based on uh, the knowledge of so many of our colleagues, a huge experience it ends up sort of not coming to the forefront. And we know it's key these days to have a reference point. And this project, it's a project that really, I didn't lead it. I was lucky enough to get the help from so many great people that, which is, which is the airway group. It is something that comes from the airway group itself, which is having passion for teaching, being passionate about sharing your experiences. And we always try to add a little bit more of what each person does and what each person likes the most. So I'd like to start the presentation by showing you our slides. Well, about this subject matter, which is the consensus on difficult airway in adults. It was published in 2024, but it started on our work, which started in 2022. I declare having no conflicts of interest. And you got to remember, I had the pleasure of presenting this consensus in 2022. For those of you that don't remember, the publication of an anesthesiology journal was in October 2022. And we put together this great team and we started working on teaching and started working on top of this article so that we could try to digest all this information, which is a uh, real, almost a, almost a book, but we try to interpret these recommendations that are so important for the American society of anesthesiology or realities in Brazil. And I had the honor of counting on the help of these folks here, great friends, great people. And 
well, we grow together, we learn a lot from one another, and this was some great interaction. The results of this was this publication of the Brazilian Journal. I hope that you all appreciate this, you can criticize it, and we're here to exchange doubts, uh, discuss things, any questions you may have, we're here for you. So how did we develop this? Truth is that with this team, because they're very experienced people when it comes to airway management, we decided to approach or try to have a sort of extreme summary. Those of you that read this, you know that the information is quite objective for the main subjects that relate to airways and that based on our consensus, what we should talk about so that Brazilian anesthesiologists have a quick access to accurate information. And if they're gonna go further in depth, they will look for more information about the subjects. So we chose these hot topics. Sure, the airways, airway management is a whole world of information. We could extend ourselves a lot, but we'll sort of get away from what our proposal was. And I will quickly present, and I hope that uh, through discussion, we can go further in depth when these subjects, this class, since I am presented it today, well, it was actually presented on the Brazilian Congress of Theology in 2022. One of the important points is the assessment. And, and this is key data that we assess our patients beforehand so we can identify predictors for difficult airways. And we know that these predictors, they can't always correctly identify things. So it is advised to use methods or diagnosis, diagnosis methods, examination methods, that possess the highest sensitivity possible. Why? Because in these situations, if we have any sort of false, false positive or difficult airway, we'll be adequately prepared. And some points we will through, through clinical history, we know that patients can have problems when it comes to approaching airways. Some authors end up pointing out that a prior history of difficult intubation or a difficult airway, it may be one of the main predictors for this difficult airway. This means that we must not underestimate the difficulties that any colleague may have had, uh, much the opposite. We must surround ourselves with the most amount of resources possible so we can avoid problems. Another thing that we want to uh, focus on is the need or the or the need for knowledge resolution 2174 from 2017 by all anesthesiologists doctors and this resolution demands a written documentation of our assessments especially when it refers to difficult airways so they care take us to perform an assessment, to perform an identification, and to not document this can be seen as a negligent attitude. So it's important for us to, to go by the rules on all the recommended items. There's no point in us forgetting about documenting things because this can have legal medical implications. You see that the, the documenting parts, significant parts, and even quite complete, according to CFM, is an important thing to do. All this data, no matter the logic we oh, because this isolated measure has no importance of oh, associating this to this, there's no importance, but, if we have a recommendation by the CFM, it must be followed. One very important point, and this point is uh, 
This comes from Dr. Vanessa. Due to being a big expert and an enthusiast of ultrasound, would be the use of ultrasound as a tool, a complementary tool for assessment airways, which must be employed actually within the surgery room, within the operating theater. We can assess a few measures, a few anatomic measures in a simple, quick manner, and it may indicate situations that may lead us to a more difficult situation. There are several measures, several authors, but a few things are easy to learn. And we may cite the distance between the skin or the thickness, the distance between the skin and the epiglottis as a fact for quick identification, quick measurement, and a learning curve that is quite quick. And uh, well, we may utilize these techniques. This is an illustrated technique, which is TACA. We identified the thyroid cartilage afterwards, the airline. You can see here this color and the second image. This indicates to the airline there is a reverberation, a very white line, as you can see it, which is the cricoid cartilage membrane. And going from there, sliding down from the cranium downwards, which is position and this transversal position, we will be able to identify the cricoid cartilage. And afterwards, once again, the airline. So these, um, these trainings must be performed on our workshops, but they may be done on the on the bedside or in the operating room after inducing anesthesia. And you can do this assessment to be able to be getting a hand on it and mainly stopping the fear of using this great resource, this simple resource, and it's a non-invasive resource when it comes to assessing the airway. Here's another approach, which is the longitudinal line assessment, and we try to identify the cricothyroid membrane or the neocricoid or the tracheal rings, identifying this beautiful image here. We call it the pearl call, the color by one of our students in this matter. And it's useful to facilitate the correct identification and the marking. You can see this image here, this lower image here where we can mark the cricothyroid membrane before the induction of anesthesia for those cases where we suspect that we have a harder time in such a way, in a situation like this, an emergency situation, which we must run against the clock, which is a non-accident, non-tube situation. We have a quick approach to the cricothyroid membrane. And if we must, we can perform with more safety the invasive another topic that we selected is the matter of pre-oxygenation including apneic oxygenation and even though it may not have a huge amount of adhesion in our medium we can imagine that during a short amount of time it may be more widely available. On pre-oxygenation, we have the goals, which is, well, imagine that the oxygen content within the organism may be like a, a car tank, and we must fill up the car tank we go on a long, before we go on a long trip. With this analogy, in our case, we must fill the tank, the patient's tank, which is the lung, and that small oxygen parcel which is dissolved in the blood to reach the maximum concentration of oxygen without induction what is the goal of this well the goal is to increase the amount of time with the patient will be able to tolerate apnea in case this situation happens when we have a, a difficulty that is not foreseen or the definite control of the airway a marker for 
effective pre-oxygenation is when we reach a, a breathed-in fraction of 0 to up, starting from 0.79 or 0.9. Pre-oxygenation may be improved or may be optimized by using the correct positioning of the patient. What was seen when we have an elevation of the patient's heading, what we call well, is the ramp position, or when we perform a reverse Limburger train or secular cleave positioning at least 25 degrees, we improve the lung dynamic and we also improve the pre-oxygenation of the patient, making these pre-oxygenation more efficient and more quick. The golden rule that we suggest to follow is that every patient that may have a possible difficulty in their airways, they must have an oxygen supplementation from the moment they go into the operating room so that they will breathe in their oxygen and they will increase their reserves. After we get ready during this next stage, a concept that is important, even though you may be able to start pre-oxygenation with a Woodson mask, with a caucus theater, anything you're used to utilizing is that the face mask at the start of pre-oxygenation with their mask must be well adapted to the patient's facial structure allowing maximum absorption of oxygen. And in some situations, like in the UK, this technique is more widely available in the UK. And that's where the technique actually appeared first. The Difficult Airway Society of the UK actually chose this technique as an ideal method for pre-oxygenation of patients that have a difficult airway, especially on these situations where the doctor gets ready to perform a wake brachial intubation, which must be one of the options, if not the best option for the intubation of patients with a difficult airway. And it's important for us to know that depending on the definition of the case by case situation and the type of work, desaturation can occur in up to 70% of intubations. And this is a powerful argument for us to be concerned with providing oxygen all the time. This concept der is derivated from the concept of apneic oxygenation. Even if you are handling the airway and you are not providing oxygen through the mask. We removed the mask to try to intubate them. The maintenance of a simple catheter, like the caucus catheter, which is available in any hospital, can provide an amount of oxygen that will make a difference. This way, you increase your safe apnea time. So this is the amount of time from where they go through apnea to the moment where there is a desaturation. So wake intubation is a underused technique in the whole world. This is a something that we repeat in every Congress, in every workshop we have when you ask who performs awake intubation. Right, well, due to the inexperience and well, it's important to it's important for us to try to work more on these concepts because they're important concepts. And sometimes anesthesiologists, since we're specialists when it comes to handling drugs, we become very concerned what the type of drug which will be utilized to sedate the patient. Oh, I'm going to use a sedex. I'm going to use a, a drug A, drug B, fentanyl. That doesn't matter really which type of drug you're going to be using. You're going to be using the drug that you have the most control over, that you are more used to handling. But the key concept is that sedation is minimal and the patient must always be collaborating. Why? Because going over any dosage, any association can be that line, that grain of sand where it will go past apnea and you have to go from a 
elective tracheal intubation into a, a reduced patient where you have to run out to intubate the patient because they're desaturating. So the main concept and the main message is that sedation cannot substitute topical anesthesia. Topical anesthesia is the keystone. It is the main, the keystone of awake intubation. So when do we indicate awake tracheal intubation? Well, according to ESA, any patient with a suspicion sent for a difficult tracheal intubation or ventilation with a difficult mass usage to any patient with difficult intubation and increased risk of, asp of pulmonary aspiration. Patients at when tracheal intubation is difficult it's ant and anticipated, but they are incapable of tolerating a quick apneic episode, for instance, where you obese people or, no, or heart patients or lung patients or critical patients, the suspicion of a difficult intubation has a provision of a difficulty when it comes to approaching the infraglottic or invasive access. So you understand that these situations are practically quite wide and they reach most patients with a difficult airway. And the question we always ask is, well, why don't we use difficult tracheal intubation? And we do utilize the quick sequence of intubation for these situations, maybe due to a lack of training, maybe due to a lack of knowledge, or actually due to a lack of fear that since we end up intubating anybody, everybody, we're going to say, okay, this will not be the case where I can intubate this person, but someday it may happen. Any isolated factor here can be clinically important to justify tracheal intubation. And the goal of this, uh, of this speech, what I'm saying is to stimulate every anesthesiologist to use this method. It's such an important tool and use it more frequently. One thing that would be something that I'm quite focused on, and it's a big new thing for handling airways last year, is video laryngoscopy, which now is quite available. It's widely available in the entire country here. And uh, well, normally people are always concerned, say, well, oh, what am I going to buy? Is this, is it this brand? Is it that brand? And sometimes we think that this concern may be the least important than the correct handling and the correct application of the technique for video laryngoscopy intubation. So VLC, actually, the VLC tool, they use a resource that we don't have on direct laryngoscopy. Tracheal intubation involves three different elements that are important, which are visualization of the laryngeal and glottic, glottic rim structures. This is a big advantage of video laryngoscopy. We cannot compare the visual rate in a, video, in a direct laryngoscopy with the vision that we have with video laryngoscopy. The passage of the tube through the vocal folds, sure, Several studies demonstrate that the employment of video laryngoscopes was capable of reduction ectophagic intubations once we can see the introduction of the tube. But there is a caveat. Sometimes, mainly with a zipper angled video laryngoscopes, the introduction of the tube through the vocal folds is possible, but sometimes you can't progress you can't continue going down the tracheal tube due to an angle video laryngoscopes they permit the approach of an airway that's pretty interior with a, with a certain certain ease but you can't always go down the tube easily it's not always possible either a consensus i'm sure this is a worldwide concern is that well, you talk a lot about it. A lot of editorials talk about this uh, regarding the um, universal employment. So video laryngoscopy for everybody should be the first option for intubation. But having a more conservative approach 
and especially in countries that do not have that much ease. They don't have as much availability of video or laryngoscopes any place, uh, anywhere in the hospital or any surgical room. It's that when we have a difficulty with direct laryngoscopy, we must not insist on multiple attempts with intubation. This is a key concept. And in this situation, we, well, it's more than a consensus that a second attempt with vitreal laryngoscopy, it's more than justified. So for us, this must be a norm that a first rescue option after a failure of intubation use direct laryngoscopy. But for that, it's important that you are trained, you are trained in the use of aerial laryngoscopes and it must be available at the, at the moment of intubation. Because if you still have to go look for the gear, you still have to go get the piece of equipment, you could lose extremely important minutes. And this can really complicate your approach to the airway. A point that is considered to be very important, and it is a factor of change, is that we may follow the intubation of younger anesthesiologists or from or anesthesiologists that are training with a higher ease. I just used that image that, okay, we would help the residents, the air using their scope, we couldn't see anything, and we kept looking over their shoulders to see, be able to see anything. This no longer happens with a visual laryngoscopy. And actually, video laryngoscopy in a few experimental studies, they provide an ease of teaching how to approach an airway with a wider look. So everybody can follow through the process and it seems to really facilitate teaching. A few authors actually proposed the opposite. Oh no, you got to learn not with direct laryngoscopy. Now you have to learn with video laryngoscopy. And afterwards, when you already know how to correctly intubate with a video laryngoscopy, direct laryngoscopy would be an advanced resources, so highly skilled in a war situation, your device isn't worker, you're out of battery power, you can't find the tool. Sure, every single anesthesiologist doctor must have the skill, but we may be presenting a paradigm shift, as they say, and now with implementation of electronic, electronic recordings, now the transfer of images, towards the patients, the patient's uh, documentation to, for assessing difficulties when it comes to discussions. It is a priceless tool because a lot of the time we go through a rough time, we manage to intubate, but you sort of lose the, the, the info of what we went through. So documentation, most video laryngoscopes, they can take pictures, they can create images, or they can record videos. So it's a great tool. It's a great resource. It, it is priceless, really. And we are seeing this gain in popularity as a first option for everyone. All right, so it, maybe I think that the number of recommendations to use reasons not to use it. And well, the recommendation is due to a manner of handling of the airway where the patient can open their mouth they have a lesser opening that 2.5 or two maybe there are reports in the literature i myself managed to have a case report with a, a, a small mouth opening lesser than a centimeter but it's not important because it's an exception a session by session it, well there's a centimeter you can do it no you can't do it you may be able to do it but let's say it's a sort of off-label thing. This is a consensus. A few, uh, a, a few doctors said uh, use two centimeters. We were more conservative, two point five. So we call them sort of fixed when it's spent. And this situation, and every exception, can be approached with video or endoscope. But here, this is a accurate indication for a flexible endoscope for intubation. A tumor and the superior tract. 
você vai ter uma dificuldade muito grande You're na have a big difficulty when it comes to approach of these procedures. A desaturation that requires the interruption of the intubation in favor Nenhuma of ventilation and oxygenation. No intubation must be done for a patient that is that is not saturating. And this is a very important recommendation, especially with critical patients where we try to get into the airway before optimization of oxygenation or circulatory. So this goes to into a lot of cases of, of cardiac arrest during the attempt of intubation. The extraglottic devices we cited this here, they are key as a tool for to keep ventilation in elective matter, as well as on the emergency rescue of the airway. They are considered to be devices for rescue, non-invasive rescue. So if you have ventilatory difficulties and the patient is desaturating, the, the resource of an extraglottic resource of controlling ventilation, reestablishing oxygenation, and giving time for you to get out of a crisis situation, hypoxemia, which is there is an urgency to control the airway, you stop and say, no, let's think about this. Let's see what we have, what we can change, maybe get a colleague that is available to help you out. So this is something that can save lives. You always rest, you, you always think about oxygenation. Right, so there is a very big trend you know, of inducing anesthesia. And this is one of the branches of the Brazil American Society branch, which is the elective control with awake tracheal intubation or control post anesthesia and induction. And what do we do? I did not intubate, but I am oxygenating the patient. So it's important for us to know that this may happen when anybody, no matter the degree of experience. Number two, that you must try to keep a pre-established strategy. You have to be ready for this, even though most of the time, you're gonna intubate a patient without many issues. But in a few situations, even more experienced doctors, they don't manage and they lose control a bit. That's why we always head upon that idea. Do not keep the same method many times. This is not this is called a fixation error. The limit to the amount of attempts must be three, according to the American society. Actually, if you would cite this, uh, the infographics, we have a line of three plus one. This three plus one is done by an expert where they come over and they help you. And they may decide to try how well, they will proceed to a next alternative. Not always after every attempt or actually during the attempt, the offer box, always offer oxygen. There's an image that, an image that we have during a difficult situation, always ask help. This is a key measure. This is derivated from our reanimation algorithms, and they are adapted to primordial situations and may be the most concerning for every anesthesiologist doctor, which is the inability for oxygenate, capillary oxygenation. And we know that if this is not solved in several minutes, then the patient may progress to cardiac arrest. Another important thing is to have situational awareness. You need to know what's going on. You need to feel what's around you. And we need to try to keep calm, passing instructions in a very organized manner, always never losing your emotional control, no matter the stress. That's something that was really focused on in these recommendations would be the maintenance of time control. And one of the things that you end up losing when you lose this awareness is that people are so involved in this process of trying to intubate it in any way possible, the patient that they sort of lose track of time. And this track of time, it must be, 
it could be key for the patient's survival. We've said this more than once. We talked about the amount of attempts. It's very unlikely that you'll be able to intubate the patient after free direct laryngoscopy attempts. If you, even if you're using the video laryngoscope, if you're trying, if you try it three times, the ability, the chances of you being successful is pretty small. Always keep an eye on oxygenation. If you must interrupt your your methods to maintain oxygenation, we already talked about extraglottic devices, but you'll be able to keep oxygenation with a simple catheter, with a face mask. As long as the patient is oxygenating, it doesn't matter the method you're using. Human factor is a subject that is sort of the, it's what's being talked about in every Congress and more recent articles. And this more, this must be incorporated into teaching. We must be ready for that. It's a factor that was always very much neglected up till 10, 15 years ago, our concern was with techniques, with devices and with devices and machines. You know, that the one that uses the machine is a human and humans can fail. Stress, fatigue, hunger, pressure to produce. These are things that we know well that hunger. That's the all this. They work a lot, all of them work a lot. They all work very long shifts. We don't always have the best equipment. There's not always a, a amount of time where you can rest. It's a tough job. And this can lead you to wrong decisions, difficulties in performing tax that if you had been rested up, you could do them. And mainly communication failures, big thing. This is something that Adding the entire crisis situation, it can lead us to problems. So a study, which is the on study, which is a prospective study when it comes to approaching airways, revealed to us that there is a number of factors that took us, that took us to a bad result for patients, such as inadequate judgment, inefficient communication and a failure to work in a team and this is key as this this can be this can and must be trained and the goal when you study human factors is to create an environment that is really towards the best results being reached and avoiding uh, stopping us from taking wrong decisions. So this is a very interesting race, which is the way to get an individual to do the right thing and makes it make it difficult or actually make it impossible to do something wrong. So soft skills involve these social, psychological behaviors that we must all work on which are learning how to work on a team, decision-making processes, sharing the next stages of the work, directing the team to perform the tasks and understanding that everybody must understand what they're doing and to keep situational awareness, which involves our controls as the control of our number of attempts the change in approaches are actually the request of somebody that could help us out if we feel that we need more help. Confirmation of intubation is a factor that has received a great amount of attention because despite a lot of advancements and the approach of the airway management, relatively simple issues still cause problems like patients passing away. And going back to resolution 2174, trying to correct problems in a 
Oh, in a way that would remember that we were doing the right thing and stopping us from doing the wrong thing. It's a determination that continuous monitoring of ventilation with capnography, but it's not optional, it must be done. And in this way, we are contributing with the safety of the patient. When you observe, well, this is an article that received a lot of attention. It was published uh, slightly after the recommendations of the American society that uh, it's an important factor. It caused great repercussions in the effort between specialists and well, why. Using the capnography, it shows that if you don't have a sustained source for CO2, there's no point of keeping that tracheal tube. You need to get, get that out and need to intubate the patient because the patient will just get worse. And we know that if we keep ventilating the patient during the exophagic pressure, it's going to expand more towards the stomach. It's possible that they regurgitate, they get bronchoaspirate, and they may pass away. And so the recommendations of this author are quite simple, and they're easy to be followed. It does not require further equipment on top of what we already have in any surgical center. They must remove the tube. Now, we are not sure that there is an exophagic intubation if the CLCO2 is not sustainable, and if the saturation of oxygen is going down. These images, Nós também, o nosso grupo, né, do, dos, dos... We must too, in this group of the instructors for the airway control group, it translated instantly as soon as the recommendations came out. We've used this in the SBA courses, showing the normal tracing that we all know, and two situations that they observed, which could indicate that really the patient is correctly intubated. A normal tracing, we have the first line, is a tracing which uh, with a very small curve, but you can see that it is growing over time. Well, it's there, it can be several situations, such as bronchospasms, but you can see here that it's getting better. You see that the curve has well, it's a few other explanations, but it has a acceptable standard. But if we compare it with this curve here, let's not go up at any point, but this curve here, which just goes down, you can see here that there is a sort of dead space and the CO2 is no longer present. So this situation with, for these authors, they recommend the removal of the tube and a new intubation. So almost at the end now, extubation. And that's the last stage of our process of airway control. And actually, don't choose to extubate the patient. We extubate at the end of any anesthesia. We extubate the patient. We do this every day. But one thing that we would like to point out is that every situation must be elective. We will choose the moment and place for extubation. Sometimes patients that went through a long surgery, maybe the best point would not be to extubate it in the surgery room. Maybe it would be better to do it in an intensive extubation unit. Another point that is very important and sadly did not change is neuromuscular residual blockage. This happens in the whole world. This can't be faced as a bad technique or as a something that they the anesthesiologist became careless about because any article shows that the percentage of between 20 and 74 percent of patients when assessed as soon as they get to the rpa they have a residual residual neuromuscular blockage 
despite the available of sub M dex. So you see that despite the sub M dex being a notifier, game notifier, muscular residual ainda existe. Então cuidado. Residual neuromuscular blockage static suggests. So be careful because starting from the pioneering work from 1980 from Professor the professor. This can still happen, and we must be aware of that. If the patient is stable, as long as there is a stability of every parameter is being there, we can afterwards guarantee all the whole operation of the neuromuscular blockage in the operating room. And how do we know that? Monitoring neuromuscular blockage. If we research work for the monitoring the use of this during standard surgeries every day, you can see that the numbers are very low when the indication of monitoring and actually the high availability of, of monitors or any other stimulus or neuromuscular transmission and the surgical center, people don't use it. So what is the monitor that we used? It's the top. It's the, any device that allows us to monitor. Want to use it? Well, wherever you use, you use neuromuscular. And an addendum is then well, whoever performs robotic surgery knows that it's difficult to install it. You can't install it. So even though you, it's a story that we use deep neuromuscular blocking to avoid issues with robotics, we end up not using it. Even though some authors suggest the use of monitoring for neuromuscular transference and the facial muscle musculature, the eyes and, well, and our medium is not utilized in the whole world, it's not really used. It's important always to, when you ex extubate, to prepare to have oxygen on hand I mean, we intubation devices and to maintain continuous oxygen. Yeah, so formulating the extubation, what must be our measured use of algorithms may use may help us a lot. Whatever it is, there's a few really good ones. Like for instance, the difficult airway community of the UK, recognizing the risk factors of the patient relating to surgical interventions, as well as the clinical conditions of the patient and cognitive aids. Sometimes it's worth it to have a device like this one in a booklet as an image, have a quick review before performing extubation. This helps and this can be quite beneficial. Most of these complications post extubation are, are avoidable. We must prepare all the necessary resources to deal with foreseeable complications and the usage of these directives for practice or the cognitive situations, they, this can result in better results in the reduction of any damage relating to the patient's extubation. I hope I hadn't take, haven't taken too long. Uh, well, sure. This has been a pretty quick summary, pretty objective summary of what we approached. And uh, as always, I will take any opportunity to divulge the airway control course that we will be performing during the Brazilian Congress of Anesthesiology. Well, the date is already set for the 13th. The definitive program is available in the FBA site, but anybody that wishes to recycle their concepts or perform training, a practical training, with some of the best specialists in Brazil, well, feel free to come over and I will be waiting for you in Belo Horizonte. That's it. Thank you very much. Great, Dr. Marcio. It's great uh, explanation uh, regarding your control.
the total control of the airway, which is what we're interested in. Patient with a controlled airway to be able to act and continue towards surgical procedures in the safest way possible. So I can see the Q&A, they have a, two questions. First from Dr. Gabrielli. Mr. Doctor, can you inform us about the reference of the study for the nasal catheter for a reduction of the desaturation during the apneic period, please? I would like to read more about it. Uh, right, so that's a good question. This has been researched a lot. There are countless reference, references. I'd like to cite, well, the first article that called attention uh, years ago was when we started to comment on that was in Dr. Patel's study in 2012. There he is one of the creators of this method. When we use the high nasal flow to perform surgeries, micro larynx, micro larynx surgeries, and they kept the patient in an apnea 20, 30, 40 minutes. So I can imagine that a patient has their unobstructed airway and implementation of the flow with a apnea period of 20 minutes. So if this concept is valid for all the patients, that's what's being studied at that point. So if you're going to look for a high flow, nasal flow oxygenation, you're going to see a huge list. So it is a consensus. It's not a consensus. Some work has been published that did not have clear benefits on a pre-oxygenation, conventional pre-oxygenation. So it's a target that will say, okay, this is useful. No, this is useful. Every pre-oxygenation technique that you learn about, that you learn to use, especially if you're going to have a pre-oxygenation technique, you oxygenate 100% with a very well-adapted facial mask. The patient's face for five minutes. We cited this in articles of free techniques. You can see these on the article, which is in BGAN. It can be equivalent. A few articles show a superiority or others show the same. So even though the group we're going to analyze subgroups, especially the obese, which was my main concern, that it can be the most benefited, the authors did not reach this conclusion. And we utilize the high flow oxygenation. The group of patients becomes more homogeneous than those that use or pre oxygenation that is non conventional. There are more patients that did not oxygenate correctly, that did not reach the HO2, max HO2. But it is a subject that is pretty big. Either way, my email is available. And if you cannot find the articles that are sufficient, you can send the articles and we'll help you. Remember that the references are on the BGAN article. So the link, the article is here. Our Mel sent this in the chat. It's available to everybody. And, uh, another question, Doctor. Good evening, MR2 for Nistology. Uh, regarding the ATET CO2 curve, what differentiates an acceptable curve, which is clinically justifiable from a smaller curve that maintains a standard, but it's not acceptable? Is there any number criteria? Yeah, they, they put down a standard, a number, a number value. This uh, reminds us the same regarding the parameters for reanimation. We know that 
It means that it is not sustainable and that it is not being renovated enough. So no matter the number, don't worry about the numbers. Worry about the quality of the curve and it is going up. If you have a very low parameter and nothing's changing, you don't need to insist on that, especially the recommendations, the care we need to have when we analyze the article. We perform this recommendation, not just thinking about difficult airways, it's recommendations for every patient. And we know that any patient that's going to be, let's say, above any patient that you worked on, if you have a dampered curve, or if it's not going up to close to 30 levels, then a patient may have an issue. You can take out the turbo and you can try again. There's no problem to reintubate the patient. The reintubation of patients after extubation, it can be a prognosis for worsening of patients. A failed extubation is not an octopus. But an extubation and these situations where you end up intubating the patient and there's no difficult criteria, a tube may have a, no issues. You're going to have a new laryngoscopy. Maybe you may have carried in what had in the first attempt. It's not uncommon. Uh, sometimes we're seeing. You can see that when you insert a tube, it sort of slides, it enters the exophagus. So very good application with Dr. Vanessa approach very well, especially in the next number of the edition of the Brazilian Society of Anesthesiology, which is the fourth edition of the book Airway Control, the third edition, sorry, the Airway Control, where if you were to use an ultrasound when it comes to the intubation, you can detect in a very clear manner the passage of the tube to exophagus. Because, well, there's a very nice image that first of all would be nice because you intubate the exophagus, but there's a double sign where the patient, the patient would have two tracheas because the tube creates a situation that is similar to the patient's trachea, which is a double sign, air sign. And then you, in real time, in less than a few seconds, because you can see it in real time, there's no delay. And a few authors compare it, because sometimes the capnography takes a few moments to detect the CO2 core curve. And you're going to take longer to perform this diagnosis in an exophagus situation. While if you use the ultrasound, would have the diagnosis at the point, but or you can go back and you correct it. So one more advantage, very well explained advantage by Dr. Vanessa. Well, you can see her, her chapter as soon as the book is available. And I remember that we anesthesiologists in the surgical center, we're pretty used to capnography and capnography curves. For instance, the the emergency room intubation. They don't have capnographers. You'll hardly find an intensive therapy in the ICUs and the CDIs. Well, the ultrasound, it's equipment that makes a difference at those points when it comes to like those, as well as the emergency moments when it comes to identifying vital parameters, uh, so to speak. And well, there's no more questions in the Q&A. So, well, you can send our question, your questions. And uh, remember, Dr. Mauricio comes to the course in the book and the third edition. It's sort of, uh, it's a name that really makes a difference. The control of the airway. The airway is not controlled then. You're going to have a lot of problems. I agree with you, Vanessa, because for a long time, you know, the, the translation that uh, the language is, 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 is airway management, we use management. 
This generated translation back in the day, the last wrong way, which became handling of the airway, approach of the airway. I never liked management in Portuguese, the way it's used in Portuguese, because it seems like you're sort of messing around with it. You're touching it, or it's it, it doesn't bring you that position, which is control it. And control for us, or a more modern concept, does not mean to intubate. Actually, intubation is one or two components, which may be the best alternative for a certain patient. But actually, the control of the airway means to keep the patient well oxygenated and well, well, well ventilated. And you may use a few resources for that. Actually, mass ventilation is good. Airway control. This is something that I like to remember now that I have so much time. But uh, Dr. Orsons is here. He's watching us. So for a long time, it didn't intubate the patient. You kept the patient in that this is here, ventilating. Under a mask and they perform surgeries like that. So we're not going to go into detail, but it's possible for the patient to keep the patient anesthetized and, and a mask. So this training I consider to be essential. Bring the younger folks. They complain that I try to keep them ventilating so long, but they all complain that, ah, oh, their arm was shaking. It hurt. And I said, keep your arm there. Your arm is not tighter. You will continue to ventilate this person. And uh, so oh, it's a main component for the definite control of the airway. It is very important in many circumstances. And well, these days, I understand that airway control involves the whole approach of during the mass ventilation with the extraglottic devices, macular intubation, or infraglottic approach or invasive approach to the airway. This is all the airway control. And mainly within this control, we focus on the need that everybody develop skills when it comes to the awake vacuole intubation. This is key. Using these resources, in the most cases, you'll feel safer to approach these patients that need it. So the chances of having a saturation, a serious situation, if you don't intubate, don't oxygenate, it's much less likely and for most circumstances, if you are don't have success in your wake tracheal intubation, the patient will have no issues going back to the bed, to the operating bed, and you have no problem going back to RPL. You can reschedule the case when you take the decision of inducing anesthesia. We sort of are, we're on the roller coaster, and there's no going back there. Even a reinversion of the neuromuscular blockage, which is from the DEX, making as a, it's a sort of big tool for the reversion, a quick reversion of the blockage. It can take you a few minutes. It is not immediate, even if you use several ampules for a supramatex. Now it's uh, in the owner, brand owner, they wanted to use it in any way possible. It will take some time, and this time may be the difference between life and death for a few patients. So, what I always like to say is learn, do it, train. According to Dr. Horton's luck here, we'll get. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Bom, temos mais uma pergunta. Well, there's another question. Doctor, good evening. Could you please speak a bit more about the indication of uh, wake IoT in a quick sequence? Thank you. I don't know who this is, but thanks for that. I'm going to start a new presentation. Uh, well, the most important thing is when we have a patient with a full stomach or the situation 
where we mentioned here, you see several situations. These days, a lot of attention was given to physiologically difficult airway. The majority of patients, uh, typical patients for this are critical patients. They have comorbidities. They saturate very quickly. And they're not always collaborating. So this is why when we talk about wake tracheal intubation, it is uncommon in intensive therapy because these are patients that are not very collaborative, they're critical, they want to solve everything quickly. And the anesthesiologist acquired this need for a quick sequence because well, we know that the success rate of any intubation is very high. I already cited the number above 70%, above 90%, about 0.5 will be hard work and uh, may not be able to intubate in the first attempt, but you'll end up intubating. It's a uh, really, it's a statistic from several articles and I'm close to one or two percent they may that may be possible. So why is it explained to induce so much? Well, it's because we have very high success rate. Tracheal intubation, I like to cite this work Dr. Willens Rosenblatt, who actually, he read, I read this at the same time where we were translating the algorithms for the American city, and it had a and said analgesia, not critical criticizing, but checking again all the algorithm points, what had changed, what had changed. Going to the end, he talks talks about awake and intubation and what he cites is that this is also cited by the the difficult airway society uh, the huge percentage of 98 percent of the cases or actually more was that when you needed to choose between inducing and performing awake track intubation the person would end up intubation as we said here for advocates for airway control previously not so what i've always asked everybody is that why are you going to induce if you can perform awake regular intubation if you have a patient with a tce they don't collaborate they don't open them out so it's a kid that you know they don't have this but i'm not gonna go into this uh, pediatrician's part because that's going to be the next meeting and you're going to see the great work that was done by a great team of specialists in pediatrics and for for kids in this case you cannot do a wake intubation because the basic premise is the collaboration of the patient and when we explained we explain to them why they're being this is being done awake because you're going to intubate it awake, especially when we learn to perform good topical anesthesia. This procedure, this is very well tolerated. And I heard from folks saying that no, this is evil. We treat a patient like this, evil is for you to induce anesthesia in a situation where you had several indications that would be difficult to intubate the patient. You can't intubate them and they'll die. That's evil. So, so I said, sure, complication. Yeah, desaturations, broncoaspirações, eh, arritmias, arrhythmias, or maybe serious hypoxia, a badly done hypoxia can leave you there. Much as likely to have this uh, complication where the patient is awake when you perform induction. So that's why we think that if you perform a good topical anesthesia, the patient is, is awake. You can always see this in the class is that it's stored for the patient. I have a picture of mine, my picture, which I always ask the patient, everything's okay? When they are intubated with the trachea, and I said, yeah, he shakes his head, he gives a thumbs up. Or so 
this intubation is comfortable, and that's how it has to be, ideally. Not a war. And people, people think that, that impression they have is that people have this negative notion, negative impression of this, because they saw a wake tranquil intubation that was madly done, or it was a rush. Time pressure exists everywhere. But if you understand that this is to the benefit, people wait. There's no point. And it's waited for a long time. Yeah, uh, several surgeries for stomach and full stomach surgeries. And you can have an induction to perform an awake intubation. Okay, I'm going to spend more minutes. Sure. There's no problem. And spend a few more minutes with the induction that didn't work out. Patient vomited, they, they rested in, and then they passed away. Maybe the minutes will be spent at court. And you'll be answering, why did you do that? So it's a huge subject, and I think that it's uh, just a brush stroke regarding that. Uh, for a friend of ours that is curious, Look for us in the Brazilian Congress. We can talk personally, especially if you participated in the airway course. We can spend hours talking about that. Remember that nobody is born knowing everything. These are all techniques, strategies that must be trained by everybody, not just by starters, but seniors as well. We must master the techniques as technical skills as well, soft skills when it comes to the control of the airway. Just wanted to add something. I don't know if there's more questions, but just to one more thing on a subject that I think is very cool. Uh, it's also we change the paradigms because the wake tranquil intubation is based on the use of flexible endoscopy. I'm choosing this term because it's something that we reached a consensus upon and was adopted. Something that is going to be shared now. It's very good. Dr. Claudia Luigi, because uh, wrote a chapter for intubation for flexible endoscopy, suggested this name and said, great, you create a, a great a new name and he substitutes bronchial fibroscopy. He said, these days we don't use fibroscopes anymore. And so fibroscopy is something of the past. They don't use fibers anymore. They just have a similar technology to that we use in video learning scope. So, well, the awake information, this is a limiting factor because, well, the difficult airways because wake to practical intubation can be used in a direct langoscope. That's a sort of considered a gold standard, but recently we've seen that the gold standard was sort of taken up by the vitreal endoscopy. It's a great technique for the wake vitreal endoscope because the vitreal endoscope. Due to the stimulus, due to this repercussion, dynamic repercussion, which is much lesser than direct laryngoscopy, it allows for the video laryngoscope, neighbor the patient's mouth with a good topical anesthesia, it can actually visualize the intubation capacity. So, what we call this the open eyed look, we have a good topical anesthesia. You visualize the airways and no, it's fine. If you want to, you can intubate, you're fine. There's going to be no problem. And it makes, if the topical anesthesia is very good, the sedation is great. No, you can just work with the awake patient. It's no problem in elective cases. 
for those that are not full stomachs, well, they can anesthetize below the vocal cords with the anesthesia spray. So anesthetize the, trach the trachea, so wait a few minutes and then you know, the patient is intubated, it will wake, goes for the vocal cords without coughing a lot. There's no cough, it's normal, but if there is very well done anesthesia, they won't even cough and they tolerate you know, the tube without issues. So it's a new technique that substitutes the flexible endoscopy in many cases. Here I need to point out the flexible intubation is a resource that is, cannot be understated. It is a gold standard for a difficult airway because it is adapted to the patient's airway. While the beta laryngoscope does not adapt, and we must create a path for the tube to reach through the vocal cords. So, countless times, they are the patient, use the laryngoscope, intubate, and you're done. If you don't have that limitation that we put up as a counterindication, we can intubate. Many studies show this. So comparing the video laryngoscope, it's a flexible laryngoscope. Just to add, because I think a colleague may have thought about that, I want to add to that. Wait, Dr. Marcio is in an encyclopedia, a human encyclopedia. So, so no more questions. So in the QA, I. Uh, as to Dr. Andre Schmidt to finish, and I am thankful to all of your presence. And uh, please uh, make use of this, read the Vijan editorial. So, this is everything easy to understand for you, so Dr. Andre. Thank you, Dr. Vanessa, for the moderation, and thank you, Dr. Marcio. It was great, great class. I think the best airway class. So, a great class that will be widely spread. We must spread our residents, and everybody has this notion. Dr. Marcio managed to speak about this in a practical, didactic manner, all the type of the airway control based on evidence, the most modern possible. So it's a peril that must be spread to everyone, and discussion was great. This to be able to close the content of the class, and I'd like to ask everyone to be able to go up at our next webinar. At the start of May, uh, May the second, with a difficult airway approach in pediatrics and a COPA, will be at the SBA stand. We'd love to have you all there to be able to discuss more about the magazine, which was published. What's best in the in Brazil and science. Agradeço mais uma vez pela atenção. Maria, thank you for your attention and uh, good evening. Boa noite. Boa noite.